Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Fathers and mothers of America, attention please. Upon the training you give your children today depends the future of America. Our system of free enterprise, personal liberty, and democracy cannot exist without educated and enlightened citizens. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have some helpful suggestions for parents. If you wish to equip your children to take advantage of all the opportunities the future offers, don't miss this important message. Tonight's FBI file, Death for a Draft Dodger. No other soldier in the world is prouder of the uniform that he wears than the American soldier, nor grumbles as much because he is in it. That is an American boast because we are proud of the fact that we are not traditionally a nation of goose-stepping professional soldiers, that we are instead a nation of peace-loving people who cherish the handshake far more than the hand salute. Therefore, none of us censors the young man who answers the call to uniform with a good, healthy American grumble. Nor do we censure the parent who joins him in it. But we do condemn the young man and the parent who, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, who conspire to evade that call. We condemn them in the name of those millions of Americans down through the 170 years from Bunker Hill to the Bulge, who likewise grumbled at the call to duty, but who gave, or stood ready to give, the last full measure of their devotion to it. In the Davenport home at Great Bay, Long Island, Richard Davenport III, a member of what the Society of Pages of the New York Papers call the Long Island set, is sitting despondently in the library. He hears footsteps in the hall and calls out. Is that you, Mother? Yes, Richard. Have you got a moment? Why, of course, darling. Oh, I thought you'd gone sailing with Nanny Hartford. Well, I... I'd planned to, but... There was some rather distressing news in the morning mail. What do you mean? Look at this. Mm -hmm. Greetings from the President. What? The draft board has ordered me to report for my physical. Oh, Richard! But there must be some mistake. No, I'm afraid there isn't. I'm to appear two weeks from today. Well... I never heard anything so outrageous in my life. What do they want with you? The war is over. I know. You've already made your sacrifice, working in that defense plant, buying bonds. They don't consider that essential any longer. That's why I'm being called. 
Well, I won't stand for it. You're 26 years old. You've done your bit. Let them, let them call in some of the riffraff, young men with no future. Put them in the army. No, no, Mother. There's nothing we can do. You run along. Oh, you poor, poor darling. You're being so brave. No, I'm not really. Honest, I, I, I don't want to go. And I'm going to see to it that you don't. But, Mother, what can we do? I don't know. But there must be some way to keep you out, and I am going to find it. On the morning several days later at the Davenport home, Mrs. Davenport brings a breakfast tray to her son's bedroom. Richard? Uh, Richard, dear. Uh-huh. Wake up, darling. Uh, well, what is it? I have your breakfast tray here. Oh, bring it back later, Mother, please. I, Wait I a minute, wanted... son. I have some very exciting news. Hmm? Huh? It's about your going into the army. I found a way to keep you out. What, what did you say? The army isn't going to accept you. Now, come on, wake up and listen to me. What is this? Well, I went to a dinner party last night at Helen Brockton. Mm -hmm. Her son is just about your age. Yes. Well, during the war, he did a magnificent job in the defense plant, just as you did. Uh Uh-huh. And a few weeks ago, he also received a call from the army. He went down for his physical, and they wouldn't accept him. Oh, Mother, that doesn't say... Let me finish, please, dear. There was a special reason why he wasn't accepted. There's a... There's a doctor that Helen met a few weeks ago. He gave her son some sort of uh, treatment so he couldn't pass the physical examination. Oh. And, darling, we have an appointment to see him the first thing in the morning. Mrs. Davenport was not the only one who had developed a personal interest in the doctor. Earlier that morning in the New York field office of the FBI, Special Agent Gregg was summoned to the office of assistant to the agent in charge, Barnes. You sent for me, Mr. Barnes? Oh, yes. Come in, Gregg. Just received a general bulletin from Washington you can start working on. Yeah? What is it? Man and his wife posing as a doctor and a nurse assistant. Huh? Yes, the case just came to light out in San Francisco. Several months ago, the fake doctor helped a couple of young men to flunk their army physical. <laughs> I thought that went out when the war ended. Well, there's evidently a market for it still. Now, here's a full description of the couple, and uh, photos are on the way. Uh-huh. Uh, how do they operate? Well, the familiar pattern. They administer increasing doses of a drug until the so-called patient has a simulated heart condition. Then after he flunks the exam, they bring the heart back to normal with a counteragent. Well, what I meant was, how does he manage to operate as a doctor? Oh, well... Well, in California, he used a forged diploma from Golden Gate Medical and a forged state license. I see. Did they skip out of California? Yes, and so far there's no lead on where they've gone. Uh, what's our move? Well, just in case they're headed east, how about checking with the Army here for any recent rejections because of bad hearts? Okay. Particularly young men from well-to-do families. Right. Get it right away, Greg. <laughs> Hello, my dear. Well, where have you been? What? Mrs. Brockton's sending a patient over to you. Oh? Mrs. Richard Davenport II. She'll be here any minute with her son, Richard III. That calls for a Shakespearean couplet, my dear. Oh. But I have more important words for you. What are you talking about? I have this day concluded negotiations for the purchase of a 23-room house. What? A house nestling high among the pines in the glorious Adirondacks. How many drinks have you had? Mildred, my love, we've planned right along the establishment of a private sanatorium. Yes, of but... Of course, the purchase of the property has rather done in the exchequer, so we shall spare one or two more lads the inconvenience of going into the army. And then, as the saying goes, blow. And that should be Richard III now. Then cut out the Avon accent and start making like a doctor. Yes? I'm Mrs. Davenport. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. Mrs. Brockton just telephoned. Uh, Won't you and your son come in? Thank you. Come along, Richard. Very well, Mother. This is Dr. Boone. Good morning, madam. Hello, doctor. I, uh, I hope you don't mind Mrs. Brockton telling me about everything. I'm sure I can rely on your discretion, Mrs. Davenport. Of course you can. 
I place my reputation and my personal fortune at stake each time I perform such a service. I'm sure of that. And I'm willing to do it only because I believe that the sons of our better family should remain in the position to which they are born. Oh. It's for the good of our society. How right you are, Doctor. But uh, because the risk is so great to me, I feel that I should be properly compensated. Yes, of course. My fee is $7,500. Oh, well, uh, well, you uh, require it all in advance? You may arrange with my assistant to pay half of it now and the other half the next time you come in. Very well. It will be necessary for your son to remain here, of course, for perhaps a week to allow time. Dr. Boone. Yes? Uh, is, there, is there any possible danger in the treatment, I mean? Well, if it were administered by a charlatan, yes. But by me, a physician, none whatsoever. Come in, Mr. Barnes. Oh, come ahead, Greg. I've checked on three heart cases so far that the Army rejected, but they're all legitimate. I'm getting a couple of more this afternoon. Received a bulletin early this morning from Washington, relayed from the San Francisco office. Oh, have they got a lead? Yes, the fake doctor bought a used car from dealer there about the time he disappeared. He must have bought it for traveling. He did. He went to St. Paul. How do you know? Well, Mason in the St. Paul office just called. Oh. The doctor sold the car to a dealer there four weeks ago and booked space on Northwestern Airlines for New York the same day. Well, how does Mason know? He checked transportation offices there. The airline's ticket agent recognized the photos. I see. What, uh, what names did they use? Dr. Randolph Boone and Miss Mildred Taunton. Mm, then I'd better start checking the airline here for a lead. Right. Well, Mr. Davenport, how are you feeling today? Not so good, Doctor. I'm having trouble getting my breath. Well, that's a natural reaction. Have you been taking your pills regularly? Yes, sir. Every three hours. Well, that's splendid. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Boone. Yes? May I see you a minute, please? Surely. Excuse me, Mr. Davenport. Of course. What do you want? Mrs. Davenport's in your office. She insists upon seeing you. What about? I don't know. Well, I'd better find out. You stay in there with him. Okay. I'll be back in a minute. Well, good morning, Mrs. Davenport. Good morning, Dr. Boone. What can I do for you? Well, it's been three days, Doctor. I, I thought I'd come over and see how my son is doing. He's doing splendidly, splendidly. Could I possibly see him? Well, he's sleeping right now. I'd rather you didn't disturb him. And you're quite sure he's all right? Certainly, certainly. <laughs> Very well, then. I'll come back when he's Oh, uh, by the way, Mrs. Davenport. Yes? <clears throat> I believe you were to take care of the other half of the fee when you came in. Oh, oh yes, of course. I, I, I can make you out a check right now. No checks, please. Oh? That's why my assistant had you go to your bank for the cash the other day, Mrs. Davenport. I can't afford to run the risk of any written record of such transactions as this. Oh, I'm sorry. I quite forgot. So if you don't mind making another trip to your bank now... Oh, no, not at all, Doctor. I'll be glad to. Uh, doctor? Yes? One of the patients, it's time for his next treatment. Oh, very well. You'll have to excuse me, Mrs. Davenport. Of course. I I'll be back from the bank as soon as I can, Doctor. And the balance, you recall, is... $3,750. That is correct. I'll see you later, Doctor. Now, what's the matter, Mildred? You better think of something quick. What? Something's wrong with young Davenport. Come on, hurry. But what is it? He's passed out, breathing heavily. Good heavens. I think he's in a coma. You never saw one. It's just the same. You better do something and do it quick. Richard. Richard. That's not going to do any good. Maybe you know what to do then. Might be a good idea to call a real doctor. Are you kidding? Richard. What good do you think slapping him is going to do? Well, sometimes it brings people out of a faint. This is more than a faint. And I'm scared. Oh, shut up. Richard. Richard. Wake up. Well, do something, will you? I'm trying to. You ought to remember something. You ought to read reading those medical books. Oh, for the books, love of heaven, it. shut up. I... Look. Listen, he's... Quiet. Uh... 
that's that. We will return in just a moment to tonight's FBI file. Now, time for our three questions and answers on education. First question. How much more does the average man with a college education earn during the course of his life than the average citizen of this country? Would you say $10,000 more? $25,000 more? In actual fact, college men earn a total of $72,000 more during their working years than the average American. Nevertheless, the greatest advantage of education is not measured in dollars. In every community, a high proportion of the civic and social leaders are men and women whose native abilities have been developed by college training. That's why thousands of far-sighted parents make sure of their children's education by means of an equitable educational fund. Second question, what is an equitable educational fund? It is a plan that includes these important features. The equitable educational fund makes sure that money for education will be ready when your child is ready. If you die, the educational fund becomes fully established. If you are totally and permanently disabled, the educational fund continues to build up without any further payment. Educational costs are spread out over many years instead of being concentrated in a few. Last question. How much will it cost to send your son or daughter to college? That question is answered in a memorandum recently prepared for Equitable Society representatives. It tells the cost of tuition, board, and lodging in 192 leading American colleges. In addition, it summarizes the long-range opportunities open to educated men and women in 29 industries and professions, such as architecture, dentistry, engineering, chemistry, life insurance, social service, information that every parent should have. Your nearest Equitable Society representative has a copy and will be glad to show it to any sincerely interested parent. Call him tomorrow. You'll find him in the phone book under Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file. Death for a draft dodger. The criminal fraud has been found practicing deception for profit in almost every vein of business and professional life in America. And it is inescapable that from time to time he should make his appearance even in the medical profession. And no one is more eager to expose him than are the members of the profession themselves. For of all the professions, theirs is founded on perhaps the most sacred of all trusts, the safeguarding of human life. It was a doctor whose identity shall remain a secret in the files of your FBI. It was a doctor who first exposed the criminal quackery of the imposter in tonight's case and set the FBI on his trail. It was shortly before the pseudo-Dr. Boone's drug administrations produced their fatal results in his improvised clinic on Long Island that Special Agent Gregg stepped up to the counter of the baggage check room in New York City Airline Terminal. Are you in charge here? Yes, sir. I'm a special agent of the FBI. My credentials. Mm-hmm. Well, what can I do for you, sir? About four weeks ago, a middle-aged man and woman came to the terminal by limousine from LaGuardia Field. Mm -hmm. They reached here about 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. They had six pieces of luggage, and they went first to the northwestern counter to make an adjustment about excess baggage charges. I see. Now, the clerk over there seems to remember the man asking where he could check the bags for the time being. And the clerk directed him to your counter. Oh. Would you still have a record of the bags being checked here, even if they were picked up later? Not if he picked them up himself. But if he had somebody else pick them up or had them delivered somewhere... We'd have a record of that. I see. Now, tell me, uh, do you recognize the persons in these photographs? Oh, well, I... I don't recognize her, but... Yes, sir, that's him, all right. How do you know? Well, that goatee and those glasses on that ribbon. 
Yes, he had six bags like you say, but he only checked four. Then a few days later, an expressman came for them. I got it all down in my book here. Uh, what date was that day? The 10th of last month. And I'll find it sure. Let's see now. Six, eight, nine. Uh, here it is. Tenth. Dr. Randolph Boone. Yes, we sent the bags to Great Bay, Long Island. Good. Let me have the street and house number. Well, just don't stand there looking at the body. We've got to do something. I was just thinking, Mildred, human beings cling so frantically to life. Uh Uh-huh. Yet only death offers that which they most desire. Complete and everlasting freedom. Your philosophy's as phony as your doctor's license. They both served me rather well, Mildred. But do you realize that boy's mother's going to be back here any minute? Oh, let's go into the office. Well? I think this is a propitious time for us to retire to our sanatorium in the Adirondacks. Did you pick up the sanatorium stationery at the printer's this morning? It's on the desk there. What name did you give me? Dr. Beaumont. Well, that's very nice. Look, we're never going to get out of here before his mother arrives. I don't intend to, my dear. Well, what do you expect to tell her? There she is now. Just come in. She'll wait a moment. What are you doing? Preparing for our interview. But, but that's ether. That's right. Well, what are now you... hand me that sterile face mask quickly. Here. Now ask Mrs. Davenport to come in, Mildred. Okay. Come in, Mrs. Davenport. Thank you, Miss Norman. I got back from the bank as quickly as I could, Dr. Boone. Here's the rest of your fee. Oh, thank you. You needn't have been in such a hurry. I thought my son might have wakened while I was gone, and I am so anxious to see him. You know how mothers are. Yes, of course. (laughs) Then I may see him now? (coughs) Well, the boy is... He's still asleep. But uh, I see no harm in your having a look at him. Oh, thank you so much. But, Mrs. Davenport... Yes? It's quite important that the air he breathes be as germ-free as possible. So I must ask you to wear this sterile face mask. You won't mind, I'm sure. Oh, certainly not. If you'll face the other way, I'll tie it on you. Oh, thank you. There we are. Good heavens, it smells so strong. That's right. Ether. No, no, now just breathe deeply, Mrs. Davenport. That's it. Breathe deeply. There. And now, Mildred, you see why I did not intend to leave without seeing Mrs. Davenport. This must be the reception room, Lawrence. But we're not waiting, Greg. We'll knock once on this private door here and then go in. Let's go. Uh-oh. Looks like a hasty exit. We must have cleaned up. Hey, Greg. Huh? Do you smell ether? Yes. And no wonder. Look. What? That woman on the floor. See what's in the back rooms while I look after her. I'm afraid, Mrs. Davenport, that there's not much that anyone could offer right now in the way of comfort. Oh, Richard, Richard, my son, oh, my son. We've already put out an alarm for the man and woman, but, uh, well, as far as you're concerned, that's rather a futile gesture. Oh, it's I who am really guilty, not they. I killed him just as surely as if I'd given him the drug myself. It would have been my duty to say that, Mrs. Davenport. I'm glad you've made it unnecessary for me, too. But there is one more thing I must say, no matter how ungracious it may sound. This is America, Mrs. Davenport. Her rights and privileges belong to all of us in equal measure. And so do her obligations. Your son has paid a great price for shirking his duty, but... at that, he's more fortunate than you. He doesn't have to think about it anymore. Mr. Barnes. You you want me, Greg? Please. Excuse me. I found this in the desk drawer. What is it? A receipted bill for some printing. Dated this morning. Oh? Well, what about it? Look at the name on it. Mm, Dr. Beaumont. I'm going over to see the printer. Right. Ah, 
Mildred, my dear, we couldn't have chosen a more dramatically appropriate moment for our arrival here. I'm tired. Look across to the east. Yon rising sun already rose tinting the waters of the lake spread below marks the beginning of a new day. And I'm hungry. Woman, have you no poetry in your soul? Are we going to sit out here all day? Very well. Let's get out, my dear. You needn't bother to what? get out. And who might you be? A special agent for the FBI, <gasps> and you're both under arrest. Now, look here. Whoever you are... This is who we are, and unlike yours, our credentials are not forged. Yes, but... The printer in Great Bay, Long Island, had a poor memory. But fortunately, printers always keep a sample of whatever they print. This letterhead told us where to find you, and a plane helped us beat you here. A new day, huh? Why, you stupid fool! For the death of young Richard Davenport through the criminal administration of drugs, the pseudo-doctor was sentenced to life imprisonment. For her complicity in his illegal practice of medicine and for consenting to violate the draft laws, the wife is now serving a long term in a penitentiary. Now I'd like to read you an important message prepared especially for this program by Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Uniform Crimes Report Bulletin containing tabulations from police departments all over the country has just been published. It reflects the greatest increase in crime since we first began compiling figures in 1930. During the war years, more persons aged 17 were arrested and fingerprinted than in any other age group. In the past six months, however, a shift has occurred. The 21-year-olds now lead in arrests. They are the juvenile delinquents who have grown up during the war years. This emphasizes that now, as never before, parents must do everything in their power to make their homes a place of learning as well as a place of living. We of the FBI have been happy to lend our assistance to this program as it is one way of enlisting your aid and assistance in our never-ending fight for a more secure America. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But now, again, let me remind you to check with your Equitable Society representative about the safest and wisest investment a parent can make for his children's future, an Equitable Educational Fund. Without obligation, he will also show you the Equitable Society's memorandum on the costs of higher education and some of the opportunities it opens. You'll find your Equitable Society representative in the phone book under the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the diamond-studded Double Cross. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another exciting story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the diamond-studded double cross on... This is your FBI. 
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Fathers and mothers of America, attention please. Upon the training you give your children today depends the future of America. Our system of free enterprise, personal liberty, and democracy cannot exist without educated and enlightened citizens. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have some helpful suggestions for parents. If you wish to equip your children to take advantage of all the opportunities the future offers, don't miss this important message. Tonight's FBI file, Murder on the Range. Since the time of Eve, there have been nagging wives who drove their mates to commit crimes for the gratification of their own selfish desires. A few of these crimes have made history. The rest, like that in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, have seldom caused more than a ripple on the day-to-day -day flow of news. But they're important, for each contributes its unit of force to the wave of crime constantly beating against the underpilings of law and order on which society rests. In a roadside lunchroom located on the seldom used Montana highway, Betty Adams, wife of the proprietor, is just handing a check to her lone customer. Here you are. It comes to 40 cents. Here's a half a buck, Mrs. Adams. Keep the change. Thanks. Good night, ma'am. Night. Betty. Oh, Betty. Yeah. That fellow leaves? Mm-hmm. Think maybe we should close up? I think we never should have opened. Oh, now, Betty, please don't start nagging. I again. ain't nagging. I mean business. What are you talking about? I'm fed up with this place. Fed right up to here. Betty. I mean it. Either you take me back east or I'm going by myself. What? We can't leave here now. Why not? All we've got in the world is tied up in this place. Then sell it. Sell it? Yeah. You could hardly give it away since the new road bypasses. Then let's walk out on it. Are you kidding? You'll find out if I'm kidding if you don't. Wait do a minute. So Jack, I've already I told said you. wait a minute. Well... You seem to have forgotten the main reason why we came out here. I know, I know. You done a stretch and you wanted to start all over again on the square. Don't wave that flag again. But, honey... You could have started all over back east. Then why'd you come out here with me? Because I fell for that picture folder talk of yours. And from now on, when I get the bite to see a little scenery, I'll stick a quarter in the translux and get ten minutes worth of travel off. Betty, you've got... Yes, sir? Hello, Jack. Huh? Marty. That's right. Where'd you come from? Just passing by. I thought I'd drop in. Is this the bride, kid? Yeah. Betty, I, I want you to meet a... a guy I used to know back east. This is Marty Williams. How are you? How do you do? Marty, how'd you know I was here? I forget who gave me the office. I'm glad I remembered it, though. What do you mean? Well, I pulled a little job in Seattle to get myself a stake and was heading back east. Uh-huh. 
I got in a game over in Idaho this afternoon and lost my role. There was an argument, and I had to wing a guy. You mean you shot him? That's right, sweetheart. That's why I headed here. Oh. I gotta go under for a few days till they stop beating the brush for me. Marty, maybe you haven't heard. What? I'm square now. Is that a turn down, kid? No. Huh? If you're in trouble, Mr. Williams, you can stay here as long as you like. Now, look, Betty... I said he stays. you get up, Mr. Williams? About an hour ago. Can I fix you something? Some eggs, maybe? I already had them. Came in here and cooked my own. Huh? Where's Jack? He'll be down in a minute. Tell me something, will you? What? Is Jack really leveling with that honest John pitch? Yeah. Sucker. I've been trying to tell him that. This trap looks like it's starving to death. It is. And why don't he get off this kick? Step out and steal a few. Talk to him about it, will you? I think I will. Got any ideas? Yeah. I took a walk around outside a while ago. I saw what might be a real good touch. Save it for Jack. Here he comes now. Oh. Morning, Jack. Morning, Marty. What got you up so early? Sunshine, fresh air. I've been up for a walk already. Mm -hmm. Seems to be a pretty big ranch around here. Yeah, it's the T Bar H. <laughs> they only got a couple of hundred thousand acres. Uh, where do they sell that cattle? They drive them to the loading pens in Canyon City, about ten miles from here, ship them to Omaha. Oh, suppose a man wanted to sell only four or five head at a time. Still have to ship them to Omaha? No, no, he he could get rid of them in town. How much? Well, good beef steers are bringing twenty, twenty five bucks a hundred. How much is that? They'll run 800 to 1,000 pounds a piece off the range. Somewhere around 200 bucks a piece, huh? <laughs> Thinking of going into the cattle business? How many could you get in that truck of yours? Oh, four or five head, I guess. But Hey, wait a minute. What are you getting at? 1,000 bucks a load and five or six loads. That'd net us about three grand a piece, Jack. I said, what are you getting at? I need cash so I can move out of here. That ought to be a good way to get it. Buddy, what do you think? Sounds swell. I'm not getting mixed up in any cattle rustling. Remember what I said last night, Jack. Now, listen, Betty, Marty's I... Marty's come up with an idea that'll give us a stake to get out of here. But... Take it or leave it, Jack. But if you leave it, I'm leaving you. Some 25 or 30 miles away in the Butte, Montana office of the FBI, agent in charge Kearney is standing over the teletype machine as it finishes tapping off a message from Washington headquarters. Franken? Yes, sir? Franken, remember the bullet that sheriff over in Idaho sent us the other day? The one they dug out of the fellow wounded in that scrap at the jukebox place? Oh, oh yeah, sure. Washington checked it against the unidentified ammunition file and found a mate. Oh? It was fired from a gun known to be owned by a Marty Williams, ex-mobster in the East. How did he get way out in Idaho? A description of Williams' checks with a description the sheriff got of the man who did the shooting. Oh, I see. According to Washington, Williams was last seen around Seattle. Well, then he must have been headed back east. Yeah. And since he's bound to be out of Idaho by now, that makes him a fugitive. And our man. Uh, but he's probably out of Montana by now, too. Unless he decided to go under for a while. <laughs> That's pretty hard to do in strange country. Yes, I know. Anyway, we can tell the sheriff who he was after and then start the ball rolling on Williams ourselves. Betty. Betty. I'm in here, Marty. Oh. Look, uh, when did Jack leave for Canyon City? Hours ago. I wonder what's keeping the guy. I don't know. You know something? Huh? 
I don't care. Oh, that's how it is, huh? Uh-huh. He don't know that, though, does he? He should. But he don't. Otherwise, you never could have conned the guy into this cattle swindle. Guess you're right. Well, that's too bad. Jack's a nice guy. Sure. If you like nice guys. You don't? Uh-uh. What do you like? Heels. Like me? Yeah, I like you. <laughs> you don't have to sound so unhappy. Well, you'd be unhappy, too, if you made a career of it. Going for heels? Yeah. Come here. Hmm? Huh? I said, come here. Well? Look, sweetheart. I feel the same way. Oh. Hi, Freddy. Hi. Marty. Oh, hi. I'm sorry I took so long. What happened? Four trips, and the guy don't ask any questions. This time, he wants to know something. What? He wants to know why a big outfit like T-Bar H is selling stuff local. And only four or five headed a crack. What did you tell him? Well, it was lucky I remembered something I heard one of the T-Bar H hands say in here one night. About how the old man was letting him run a few head of his own on the side. With the T-Bar H brand on him? I don't know. You tell the guy in town the steers are yours and the old man's letting you run them on the side and all the time they got the T-Bar H brand on them? Okay, but what I What big to... brains you got? You boys better go out of business fast. He swallowed what I told him. That's what you think. Okay, I'll prove it. How? Well, we were getting our last load tonight anyway. So I'll drive them in and sell them just like the rest. How's that, Marty? Come on. It'll be dark by the time we get over to the range. Come on up there. Uh, come on. Get up. Get up. Okay, that's it. That's four. And room for one more. I guess so. This part of the job is a cinch. What do you mean? All the western movies I ever saw had a bunch of cowboys sitting around a fire singing and playing the guitar with a couple of more out riding around the herd. They don't ride herd except in the spring for Brandon and the fall for Roundup. And the rest of the time all these stakes run loose like this, begging to be picked off? Well, every few days one of the hands rides out to check the herd scattered over the range. You must have timed things just right between checks. We've been lucky, Marty. Well, let's get number five and get out of here. Okay. Swing that lantern over here. Okay. Uh, how about Toots there with a the white face? Okay, let's... Wait a minute. What's the matter? Shh, listen. Let's cook. I'd have sworn I heard a horse whinny. Yeah? If I did, we're not by ourselves out here. Give me that lantern. Let's douse the light in case... Hold on there, you fellas. Give me that lantern. Never mind putting out that lantern. Whoa, whoa, boy. Easy, easy. Just stand where you are. Where? You ain't just helping yourselves. Hey. Don't I know you? What? I'm sure I do. You're Jack Adams, the fellow that runs that eating joint over at the That's old... That's enough for me. No, no, Marty, wait. Hey, look here, I wouldn't make no more trouble if I were... Oh! Oh, oh! Lock the back end of the truck, Jack. We're getting out of here. Well, one of you tell me what happened. We ain't got time for that. Yeah, but All I got it. All you need to know is I shot a guy and we got to lamb out of here. Jack. Yeah? Get moving, will you? I'm not leaving here, Marty. Huh? I said I'm not leaving. Don't be a fool, Jack. It's too late for that. I was a fool when I let you nag me into stealing the cattle in the first place. So you're going to stay here and let them come get you? I'm not going to wait for that. I'm going to give myself up. You don't expect me to stay here, do you? No, no. You can beat it right now with my share of the dough. You worked hard enough for it. Okay, Jack. If you want to play noble and take the rap. I'm not that noble, Marty. What do you mean? This was your job, too. But nobody knows it was me. I know it was you. What? And I'm not taking the rap for both of us. So you might as well let Betty have your car and stick around with me. 
I said nobody knows it was me. And nobody's going to know it, Jack. Why not? Because you're not going to be able to tell them. <laughs> Sweetheart, that should make me your favorite heel. Turn in just a moment to tonight's FBI file. Now it's time for our weekly series of questions and answers on education. First question. Who is the most enthusiastic believer in college education? A college president? A high school principal? Neither one. Surprisingly, the answer is the man who succeeded in spite of not having gone to college. He knows that leadership demands a background of knowledge which, if it is not developed in college can only be acquired by years of laborious effort. How do we know self-made men feel this way about college? Well, the Equitable Society has a plan called the Equitable Educational Fund, whereby far-sighted parents make sure, through life insurance, that their children will be well-educated no matter what happens. And a very high proportion of Equitable Educational Funds are taken out by parents who did not go to college themselves. Second question. What is an equitable educational fund? It is a plan that includes these important features. One, the equitable educational fund makes sure that money for education will be ready when your child is ready. Two, if you die, the educational fund becomes fully established. If you are totally and permanently disabled, the educational fund continues to build up without any further payment. Three, educational costs are spread out over many years instead of being concentrated in a few. Last question. How much will it cost to send your son or daughter to college? That question is answered in a memorandum that tells the cost of tuition, board, and lodging in 192 leading American colleges. In addition, it summarizes the long-range opportunities open to educated men and women in 29 industries and professions, such as architecture, dentistry, engineering, chemistry, life insurance, social service. The memorandum is crammed with information that every parent should have. Your nearest Equitable Society representative has a copy and will be glad to show it to any sincerely interested parent. Call him tomorrow. You'll find him in the phone book under Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, Murder on the Range. The average law-abiding citizen attributes great strength to every criminal. But criminals are not strong. They are weaklings. They become criminals because they cannot resist temptation the temptation to take something for nothing. And therein lies their fatal mistake, the mistake that ultimately proves their undoing. Because one of the laws by which human beings live is called the law of compensation. And that law says that the only thing you get for nothing is nothing. About the time that Marty Williams sent a bullet crashing into the unprotected body of Jack Adams, a horse was pounding along a moonlit trail heading for the home corral. Uh, oh. Hey, what's going on here? Well, uh, hey. hey, give me a hand. Help me off. Sure, but what's wrong? Uh, I caught two fellas huh? in Dry Creek Canyon stealing cows. What? One of them threw lead at me before I could... Oh, come on, now. I'll help you at the old man's house. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Jim, it's Hank. He's hurt. Take care of his horse, will you? Come on. Easy now. Yeah. See? Oh. Who... Who was that? One of them runs that eating joint over on the old road. What? Jack Adams? Yeah. Never seen the other before. What'd he look like? Didn't get a good look at him. Why? Well, all the outfits around got a warning from them FBI men in Butte today to keep an eye peeled for a man that... Done a little shooting crossing Idaho a few days ago. Yeah? Maybe it ain't the same one, but as soon as we get the slug out of you, 
I'm going to call the FBI like they said to him, get them over here. Got your stuff packed, baby? Yeah, all set. Let's get started. Okay, you get into my car and head on for Butte. Wait a minute. Huh? What's the idea? There's a truck outside with nearly a grand worth of moo cows in it, sweetheart. Marty, you're not going to try to... Don't worry. News of what happened tonight won't get around before tomorrow. Yeah, but suppose I'll you... I'll drive on into Canyon City with them tonight, sell them first thing in the morning, head for Butte, ditch the truck, pick you up, and we're gone. Where will I wait for you? Register at the Black Hotel. Use the name of Madison. Mrs. John Madison. Okay. Now get started. Be careful, Marty. Get started. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't think Adams would still be sticking around the road stand, Connie. Probably not, Riken, but we might pick up a lead there as to where they've gone. You think the other fellow could be the man Williams were after? I didn't get enough description of him from the cow wadi to tell for sure, but if this Jack Adams is the one I'm thinking about, and I'm pretty sure Marty Williams is the one who did the shooting. Oh, how do you get that? Oh, from Williams' record I got from Washington. He and a Jack Adams were mixed up in a gang back east, and they served a term together. Oh, Anyway, the slug from the cowboy's chest will tell us for sure when we get it in the lab. Uh, but in the meantime... We... Yes, I know times are wasting unless we get quicker evidence. Here's the road stand now. Go ahead, Rankin. Thanks. The lights are out. Just the same. Be careful. Come on. You try the door. It's open. Flashlight. Right here. Thanks. Let's go in. Don't turn on the lights. This is far enough. What? Look. On the floor there. Well. I think that's the body of Jack Adams. Yeah. Let me have a look. Is it the same Jack Adams you were talking about? Yes. I'd say that description checks. Well, then that means that... Marty Williams. But where's Adam's wife? Williams can probably answer that, too. The boys with the ranch seem to think she was pretty fickle. What did you find? <sighs> Papers. In Adam's pocket here. They look like cattle receipts. Five of them. Well, then they must have been working before tonight. Looks like they've already sold about 25 head. Where? Canyon City. Well, that's about uh, 10 miles from here. Yeah. And Williams must have taken the load they got tonight to Canyon City. Let's go. Oh, who, who is it? Marty. Oh, uh, Come on in, honey. Okay. We got trouble. What? The guy at the stock pen gave me a funny look and went off somewhere, so I dumped the cows and beat it for here. Think you went for the cops? I wasn't taking any chances. Anybody could tell you're not a ranch hand. You shouldn't have gone in the first place. Skip I told... that now. Let's get going. Tonight? The sooner the safer, baby. What'd you do with the truck? I left it there. Come on, get your stuff and let's roll. <laughs> Yes, sir. The man you're talking about drove in here at the stock pen several hours ago. Where is he now? Well, he looked suspicious to me, so I slipped off to get a deputy. But when I came back with him, the fellow had gone. Cows and all? Uh, no, sir. They're right over there in his truck. Uh, Rankin? Yes, sir. Look that truck over, will you? Right. Look, this man that drove the truck, uh, was there a woman with him? Uh, no, sir. Now, where's the deputy now? He lit out for Butte. What for? Well, he found out that this fellow who came here with the cows hired a car. To take him to Butte? He thought so, yes. Mr. Carney. Yes, Rankin? I found this road map in the truck. Oh, good. Let me see it. It's marked. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get back to Butte. But first, we'll call ahead and charter a plane. Well, baby, there's the lights of Sioux City firing up the sky just ahead. 
I won't know how to act back in civilization again, Marty. Pretty soon, good old Chicago. And then? Then we'll take this stake we got back in Montana and run it up into plenty of living for both of us. If Montana don't catch up with it. Forget it, sweetheart. Forget it. Marty, look. Huh? Those red lights strung across the road ahead. You better slow down. Yeah, I guess they're fixing the road. Somebody waving a flashlight. Maybe it's an accident. Hey, what's cooking, pal? I say what? Hey, what's the idea of flashing that light in my face? Welcome to Sioux City, Williams. What? And you too, Mrs. Adams. Who are you? What is this? We're special agents of the FBI from Butte, Montana. How'd you know we'd be here? You left a blueprint for us. Huh? That map we found in your truck, it had your route all marked out. Marty, you left a map so they could follow us? I forgot it. Why, you stupid fool! I suggest that you save your arguments for the courtroom when you're tried for murder. Marty Williams was sentenced to be executed for the murder of Jack Adams. Mrs. Adams, implicated in both the murder and the cattle rustling by Williams' testimony at his trial, is now serving a long prison term. The fate of these two petty criminals was, on the whole, unimportant. But it points out what your FBI has constantly attempted to prove to every citizen who might be tempted to make that first fateful step toward a career of crime. That no one makes crime a profitable profession for very long. It is possible to maintain a temporary advantage over the law, but sooner or later, the law must win. Whether the law be represented by your FBI, your local law enforcement agency, or both. Remember that the criminal is not strong. The real strength of the nation is in the solemn dignity of the law. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting story from the files of your FBI. And now again, let me remind you to check with your Equitable Society representative about the safest and wisest investment a parent can make for his children's future, an equitable educational fund. Without obligation, he will also show you the Equitable Society's memorandum on the costs of higher education and some of the opportunities it opens. You'll find your Equitable Society representative in the phone book under the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Death for a Draft Dodger. <laughs> The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Death for a draft dodger on This is Your FBI.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Fathers and mothers of America, attention please. Upon the training you give your children today depends the future of America. Our system of free enterprise, personal liberty, and democracy cannot exist without educated and enlightened citizens. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have some helpful suggestions for parents. If you wish to equip your children so that they will be able to take advantage of all the opportunities the future offers, don't miss this important message. Tonight's FBI file, The Return of the Mob. Last year, America celebrated victories over two powerful external foes. Victory is made possible only by the perfect coordination, the perfect teamwork of every unit of every branch of the armed forces and civilian production. Today, America is at war against a mighty internal foe, a powerful army of criminals sweeping the nation with the biggest crime wave in her entire history. And victory in this war will depend likewise on perfect teamwork. The perfect teamwork of all branches of law enforcement, local, state, and federal, plus the cooperation of you, the American citizen. Teamwork of the kind that smashed a criminal kingdom in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. <laughs> Twenty years ago, the White Horse Tavern in the city of Riverdale was a popular speakeasy and the throne room of one of the most powerful mobs of that era. Today, this tavern is only a second-rate bar and grill, looking as worn and grimy as the middle-aged man who has just entered the front door and crossed to the bar. What'll you have, mister? Uh, huh? I said, what'll you have? Oh, not a thing, thanks, sir. I just come in to look around. Well, the 50-cent tour don't start for an hour, so breeze, will you? Yeah, wait a minute, bud. Wait a minute. Yeah? I used to come in here years ago. A lot of years ago. Uh-huh. I was wondering if any of the old customers were still here. Look, Mac, I just came on this job a month ago. Take your business down the street. Wait, wait. You ever hear of Curly Silvers? Sleepy Young? No. How about George Hamilton? Hamilton? Yeah. He's sitting right back there. No kidding. Hey, Eddie, yeah, yeah, let's have a couple of beers, will you? Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful, really wonderful. Come on, drink up, baby. We gotta be moving. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, excuse me. Yeah? I was told there was a friend of mine back here. Well? George Hamilton, you know him? I'm George Hamilton. Uh, Oh, you can't be. You're too young. Look, Pop, what is this, a touch? No, no, no. I'm looking for a fellow who used to hang out here 20 years ago. Hey, George, maybe he means your old man. My old man worked for this bum. Stop, will you? 20 years ago, his boss was King Brown. I'm King Brown. What? I said I'm King Brown. They, this used to be my headquarters. George, is he leveling? Yeah, picture, miss. Me and George Hamilton... 20 years ago? Let me see that. Sure, here. Yeah. That's Pop, all right. Yeah, and that's me. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, what do you know? I thought you were sent away for life. 
I was paroled. Get out two days ago. You know something, honey? What? This character used to be the biggest operator in town. King, what brought you back here? I'm on my way to my brother's farm in Minnesota. Did you get the shorts? Need some coffee? Well, I... <coughs> yes. Got the hungries going, too? I could stand the meal, yeah. Sit down. Hey, I thought we were leaving. I want to talk to the guy. Yeah, but we got to All right, down sit down, I'll both of you. Okay. Thanks. King, my old man used to say you were the best organizer he ever saw. Well, that was a long time ago. That happens to be the business I'm interested in right now. Maybe I can pick up a few tips. How about a nice big steak? Go on, go on. Keep talking, King. I just want to fill up your glass again. Thanks. Thanks. I guess this stuff ain't as fancy as you used to drink in the old days, huh, King? Well, honey, at least the label's on the level. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speaking of the old days, you know something? What? I used to own this town and everybody in it. All I had to do was snap my fingers and they'd jump through a hoop. Why, they couldn't even lay a water main or pave a street without my say-so. You mean, unless you got your cut? That's what I said, is it? Well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess those days are gone forever, huh, King? Yeah, but only because the guys with any enterprise have either gone up or pushing daisies. What do you mean? If I was 20 or 25 years younger, honey, I could get together a mob and organize this town over the weekend. I'm glad to hear you say that, King. Huh? Because I am 20 years younger. I'll get you. I got the enterprise and I got the guts. All I need is the know-how about organizing the mob and the town. That's where you could help, King. Huh? Look, why don't you forget about your brother's farm? What do you want to do, finish out your ticket milking cows or stacking wheat? Oh, no, but I... I see, I see. Maybe those 20 cycles in the can have softened you up too much. Now, uh, wait a minute. Maybe you wouldn't know how to get started anymore. Give me another drink. Sure, here. Wouldn't know how to get started, huh? Would you? Look, first thing I'd do is get a mob together and sell protection to all the stores and shops in town. How? It's a very simple recipe, kid. You just give him the acid treatment. What's that? If the guy says he doesn't want to buy protection, you toss a little acid at him. Oh. And you never have to do it more than once, because by the time the acid has burned through his clothes and his skin, he's yelling to do business. King? Huh? Lift your glass. You too, baby. Huh? This town is going to be incorporated again. Things began to move fast behind the scenes in Riverdale, for it was barely a month later that Agent in Charge Collins of the local office of the FBI received a caller on an urgent mission. The caller was Riverdale's chief of police, Claude Monroe, and his mission? It's not news to either of us, Mr. Collins, that the old gang system of organized crime is coming to life again in this country. That's right. But it gave me a pretty stiff jolt last week to find out that it's happening right under my nose in Riverdale. Really? What'd you uncover? Well, I haven't got positive proof, but I, I'm pretty familiar with all the signs of a gang at work. Yes. You see, I was a rookie cop in Riverdale back in the 20s when the mobs were first getting started in this country. Then you must have had a hand in cleaning up King Brown's old mob here. Yes. That's why I can tell what's happening now. Not with the same mob, of course. They were wiped out when King Brown went up, weren't they? That's right. This is a new gang, but it's getting started along the same old pattern. Mm-hmm. We don't know who's running it or who the hirelings are, but this much we do know. Yes? Nearly every store and shop in Riverdale is paying protection. When did this start? Well, it couldn't have been more than a week or so ago. We've been trying to turn the light on it ever since. But, of course, as you might know... Nobody will talk. Exactly. The same old intimidation, Chris. It's hard to blame the store and shop owners much. I know. Not when their property, their work, and even their own lives are at stake. But blasted Collins... The longer they keep silent, the longer they'll be slaves. I know. Something's got to be done, done fast, or things will be as bad as they were back in the 20s. Yes. No telling what price the people of Riverdale will have to pay before we can break it up. What's your plan of action? Well, that's why I'm here. I need the FBI's help. 
job is already too big for my small force. But, Chief, I can't... I know, I know. The FBI can't step into a local situation unless some federal law is being violated. But all I'm asking now is, couldn't you at least give us a hand in finding out who's behind this thing? Mr. Monroe, we'll start to look around right now. Okay, even though anybody, I'll make another strike. That's for suckers, the way you're bowling, George. Oh, watch this. Oh, pretty lucky. Nice going, honey. Huh? Oh. Hey, where have you been, baby? I've been waiting to show you the new office. Well, let's see it. Okay, amateurs, the alley's yours. Come on, sugar. Look, George, why did you have to pick a bowling alley? Because it gives us a legal front. I'm playing it smart, sweetheart. Here we are. Now be careful when you step on the rug. You'll sink up to your ankles. George, this is beautiful. Like it? Boy, I love it. And that desk. I never saw such a production. How do I look behind it, sweetheart? <laughs> All you need is a secretary on your knee. Well, what are we waiting on? Uh, is this the right position, Mr. Hamilton? Well, let's uh, try and see. Oh, hmm. Mr. Hamilton. Proud of me now, baby? I don't know. How much money are we making? <laughs> Coming in by the crateful. I'm very proud of you. Hello, George. King, from now on, you might try knocking first. Sorry. Well, how are the payments coming in? Why? Just wondering how we're doing. We're doing all right. Any new members for the Southside Protective Association? The boys are out doing a little selling now. Uh, how about that drugstore down on Front Street? That's out. What do you mean, sir? It's a chain store. The manager can't spend any dough without an okay from the home office. And you're going to leave it like that? Well, what can we do about it? Look, kid. I told you to stop calling me kid. Whatever I call you, you better get out of the business right now if you're going to take alibis instead of dough. Listen, King. Are you going to run this outfit like a bush leaguer, or are you going to run it like I told you? Because if you're not, you better toss in the towel right now and get yourself a job jerking soda. Now, just a minute. I got to go up the street. Give me 20. Okay. Here. Thanks. Oh, and uh, by the way... When I come back, I'm going to write a letter to that drugstore's home office and show you how to get that dough coming in. I thought this was your desk, George. Oh, don't worry, sweetheart. I need his brains now. When I finish picking them clean, I'll buy him that ticket to his brother's farm. <laughs> Collins speaking. Hello, Collins. This is Chief of Police Monroe. Hello, Chief. Any news? Yeah. Those investigative tips you gave us yesterday have already paid off. Oh? The boss of the mob is George Hamilton, Jr., the son of King Brown's former lieutenant. No wonder the pattern of operation was familiar. Everything's the same, even down to throwing acid. Hmm. And here's where the FBI can come into the case. What do you mean? Well, we found out Hamilton sent a threatening letter to the head office in St. Louis of a chain drugstore here. Uh Uh-oh. But we can't get that letter. Why not? Well, it's a small one-man organization. Only four stores. And the owner, just like the other store owners here, is afraid to talk or cooperate. But you've got proof that there is such a letter. Definitely. And that's enough for us, Chief. We're moving in. Bill. Yeah, King? Where's George? back in his office. Thanks. Ellen's in there with him. Uh-huh. You forgot to knock again, King. Ellen, I'd like to talk to George alone. Okay. You don't have to go, baby. What's on your mind, King? I'd like to have a sort of conference. About what? Well, I've just been checking up. Since that drugstore kicked in, Front Street is 100% organized. So? 
So I thought it was time we were talking about my cut. George, I told you Keep he's Keep out of this, baby. King, just out of curiosity, how much cut do you want? 50%. Oh, wow. What's so funny? The difference between what you're asking and what you're going to get. And what's that? I bought it for you this morning. Hmm? This railroad ticket to your brother's farm in Minnesota. And a hundred bucks besides. I'm through picking your brains, King. Here. I get going. I'll give you a chance to say you're just kidding, son. Does this gun look like I'm kidding? No, George. Shut up. Look, you better put that down while you can get off with 50%. What do you mean? If I have to take that gun away from you, I'll take everything. Stop, will you? I mean it, kid. You ain't got guts enough to use it, so put it away. Ah. Oh. Okay. You ask for it. George. George, stop him. He ain't got nerve enough, have you, kid? Keep away from me. Well, why don't you shoot? No. No. Okay. Let go of it. Let go of it. George. Kids should carry cap pistols. We will return to the FBI file in just a moment. Now, three questions and answers on education. First question. Of our 32 presidents of the United States, how many attended a college or university? Ten? Fifteen? The right answer is even higher. Twenty-five of our 32 presidents have had college or university training. Yes, education does help equip men and women for leadership. It helps to build up the character, judgment, and integrity which identify the well-rounded American citizen. Think that over, mothers and dads, and decide now to investigate an equitable educational fund, a life insurance plan that has solved the problem of education costs for thousands of parents who are members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Second question, what is an equitable educational fund? It is a plan offered to far-sighted parents by the Equitable Life Assurance Society, and it includes these important features. One, the equitable plan makes sure that money for education will be ready when your child is ready. Two, if you die, the educational fund becomes fully established. If you are totally and permanently disabled, it continues to build up without any further payment. Three, educational costs are spread out over many years instead of being concentrated in a few. Last question. How much will it cost to send your son or daughter to college? That question is answered in a memorandum recently prepared for Equitable Society representatives. It tells the cost of tuition, board, and lodging in 192 leading American colleges. In addition, it summarizes the long-range opportunities open to educated men and women in 29 industries and professions, such as architecture, dentistry, engineering, chemistry, life insurance, social service. The memorandum is crammed with information that every parent should have. Your nearest Equitable Society representative has a copy and will be glad to show it to any sincerely interested parent. Call him tomorrow. You'll find him in the phone book under Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Return of the Mob. Long years behind prison bars may wither the body and humble the pride of the gangster type of criminal, but seldom do they erase the inborn instinct for crime the contempt for law and for the rights and property and lives of others. Freed from prison, as was King Brown after 20 years, they need only an opportunity and a taste of their former life to send their criminal blood pounding through their veins again, even though they know the inevitable end. On the floor of the bowling alley office in Riverdale lay the body of George Hamilton, 
his career as a mob leader cut short by the bullet fired by King Brown. A few miles away in the office of the FBI, agent in charge Collins was making his first move in his drive against the gang. Send for me, Mr. Collins? Yes, Terrell. I just spoke to that druggist in St. Louis, the one who received the threatening letter. Oh? As you know, he didn't want to cooperate with Police Chief Monroe. Yes. But after reflecting on the matter, he decided it was his duty to help the FBI. He's going to fly here this afternoon on business. He'll bring the letter with him. I see. I want you to arrange to meet him at the airport. Like anybody heard the shot. That is, nobody but you, sweetheart. What happens now? I don't know yet. Are we just going to sit around here with that... that body? Maybe. Jim. <clears throat> yeah? You said something to George when you were having that argument with him. What? You said if you were going to take his gun away from him, you were going to take everything. Remember? Yeah, yeah. What did that mean? It didn't include you, sweetheart. Oh, I was just asking. Look, Helen, the only reason you're not down there on the floor, too, is because I never killed a woman. It's bad luck. So what does happen to me? I don't know yet. I've got more important things to think about. Like what? Like getting rid of the stiff. Well, what are you going to do with him? Well, I can't stuff him and hang him on the wall. Very funny. So I guess we wait around here until tonight, and then you and I will put him in a car and run it off the pier in the river. Mm -hmm. Just like old times for you, I guess. Not exactly, no. Then I used cement. I met the druggist at the airport, all right, Mr. Collins. Here's the letter. Good. Hmm. It's signed by George Hamilton, all right. Yes, but the body of the letter's in a different handwriting, Terrell. Oh? Look at this sample of Hamilton's handwriting. Chief Monroe finished us. Yeah. They're different, all right. Huh? Now we'll compare the handwriting in the body of the letter with this other sample of handwriting I dug out of our files. Whose is it? A gentleman by the name of King Brown. King Brown? Mm-hmm. Monroe said the new gang's operation followed the old King Brown pattern, remember? Yes. I found out a while ago that Brown was released from prison about a month ago. Uh-oh. How would you say these two handwritings compare? It looks like King Brown has returned to Riverdale. Huh? Yes. Let's go. When did they move into the bowling alley, Chief? About a week ago, Mr. Collins. That must be the office there. Let's have a look. Right. Try the door. It's open. Probably a light switch just inside the I door. found it here. Well, I'd mm. say we're a little late. Yeah, looks like they've cleaned out. Look at that open safe in those desk drawers. What do you make of this, Collins? Well, offhand, I'd Mr. Say... Collins, look. What? That's blood on the carpet over there. Well, Brown what? must have done a little liquidating. And whoever was here last hasn't been gone long, either. What have you found, Terrell? Cigarette, still smoking in this ashtray. A woman's cigarette, lipstick on it. Hmm. That must have been Hamilton's girl. Yes. But who was liquidated? My guess is that it was Hamilton. And inasmuch as they've just cleaned out, Brown will have to get rid of the body before he does anything else. Then I've got a hunch where we can catch Brown if we hurry. Come on. King, where are you going to dump the body? Well, just for the sake of old times, I'd like to use a pier a little ways ahead. What about the car? George stays right in it. They both go in the river. Oh. King. Yeah? Have you made up your mind about me yet? Yeah. Well? Here's a pier. What's the story? The story is, baby, you know too much. What do you mean? You know I killed Hamilton, and you know who's the boss of the mob. Look, King, you don't think I'd ever double-cross you, do you? I'm going to guarantee that right now. King, what are you going to... King! So long, sweetheart. You're staying in there for the ride. No, no, 
Who are you? Special agent for the FBI. Okay, G-Man, but if you think you're going to take me... Now get up. The girl seems to have fainted, Mr. Collins. That's not what's wrong with Hamilton, though, on the floor of the car. How'd you know I'd be here? Chief Monroe, remember this pier. According to him, this is where you used to dump all your victims. Come on, Chief. We're going to get the rest of his boys. King Brown is now back in the state penitentiary serving a life sentence. And Riverdale has once more been freed from mob rule. Tonight's case in the files of your FBI was a demonstration of the kind of teamwork it's going to take to prevent the return of gangsterism to America. The teamwork of local and federal law enforcement officers plus the cooperation of you, the American citizen. Your local law enforcement officers are doing their part faithfully. And 24 hours around the clock, your FBI is doing its part. But are you doing yours? It is your fight, too. And the security of your home and your rights and privileges as an American depend on its outcome. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting story from the files of your FBI. And now again, let me remind you to check with your Equitable Society representative about the safest and wisest investment a parent can make for his children's future, an equitable educational fund. Without obligation, he will also show you the Equitable Society's memorandum on the costs of higher education and some of the opportunities it opens. You'll find your Equitable Society representative in the phone book under the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Murder on the Range. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferry, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Murder on the Range, on this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.